Hello, this is Beth Holtzman with the UVM Extension New Farmer Project. We're here today with Julia Shanks to talk about using your financial records and scenario planning. This session is part of a joint Vermont and New Hampshire project to help beginning and women farmers manage risks. It is made possible by grant funding from the USDA Risk Management Agency. We're pleased to have Julia here to share her insights on how to build successful and resilient farm businesses. So I'll turn it over to you, Julia. Thanks, Beth, um, and glad to be here with all of you today. Uh, thank you also to all of the sponsors of this webinar, uh, USDA, University of Vermont, and New Hampshire Extensions. Uh, my name is Julia Shanks. I am a recovering chef. I'm also the author of a book called The Farmer's Office. And I work with farmers, helping them achieve financial sustainability. Today, we're going to be talking about scenario planning. And scenario planning is a tool that you can use when you've got a lot of decisions in front of you. And it's actually a great way to assess and manage risk when you're trying to evaluate different options. So today, we're going to talk about scenario planning, just an overview of why bother. Then we're going to talk about the process that you'll go through for scenario planning. And then we'll look at two examples when you're trying to evaluate two different options side by side. As an example, we'll talk about whether you're interested in selling retail or wholesale, or if you're considering selling online or through an aggregator. So why bother? So scenario planning is a process to help you evaluate options. And when you're thinking about growing your business or making a shift, it can be hard to figure out how to decide which option is best because there's so many different variables. So scenario planning will help you explore and evaluate all the different variables so you can make the decision that's best for you and your business. And particularly in uncertain times, like in this post COVID world, you need to adapt quickly and choose a direction. So how do you choose a direction? Scenario planning can help. And one of the ways it can, it can really help you is by taking that sea of numbers that are swirling around in your head and getting them onto paper. You have the numbers in your head and sometimes it can be overwhelming and just the process of putting it down on paper can help you make a decision. So here's the process. First of all, you need to detail your options. What are the different options or opportunities or decision points that you need to make? You want to look at your historical numbers. You want to review your historicals and determine which numbers will stay the same, which ones are going to change. And for the numbers that are going to change, you'll need to go and research what your new costs will be. And they can be hard costs. They can be labor costs. Then you want to lay out your two scenarios side by side and compare them. And then test your assumptions. What if things go wrong? What if things just don't go like you thought they would? And then you need to make a decision. And you need to make a decision that makes the most sense for you, your family, and your business. So there are a lot of factors that are going to go into um, your decision-making process. So here's an example of four different scenarios and four different changes that you might make for your business. Some of the scenarios may be growing your business and you may think, oh, I'm just going to go with the highest growth option. You know, look, I can double my sales if I do option number three. But it's also important to consider not just revenue, but what is your net profit and what is your profit margin? So as an example, growth option number one is um, the smallest growth, but it produces the highest profit margin. For, so dollar for dollar, you're gonna earn the most profit. Option two has the highest dollar amount in terms of profit but not necessarily the highest percentage. So dollar for dollar, perhaps not as efficient, but overall it's gonna generate the most dollars in your pocket. Growth option three is more revenue, but not necessarily more profit than the other opportunities. And sometimes it makes sense just to scale back your business. Um, scaling back your business might be able to generate um, greater dollars in your pocket than where you are today. Perhaps it's not as dramatic as growing, but scaling back sometimes can be a good option to help you uh, streamline your operations and improve overall profitability. So a lot of different considerations as you evaluate your different options, it's never clear cut. So you need to think about you know, what generates the most profits, not necessarily what 
what the most revenue is, but what's the most profit left at the end of the day. Uh, what is your profit per hour? Some opportunities may generate more dollars, but they also take more time. So if you look at your profit per hour, it may be different than the net dollars. You need to evaluate your risk tolerance. Some people are more risk averse than others. I am very risk averse. So that's definitely going to impact my decision making in how I decide to take my business. Um, you also need to consider if your assumptions change or are wrong. What do things look like today versus five years from now? And you know, thinking about growth option number three, is this you know for year one or is this for year five? And it may be, um, you know, year one perhaps is not as robust as year five, so there might be a longer term trajectory. So considering your different options. So let's look at an option of Farmer Sam, and he sells his, uh, he grows greens, and he's been currently selling at a farmer's market. And he's thinking about selling wholesale instead of selling at the farmer's market because, you know, He's really not a people person, and if he sells wholesale, he thinks he can, you know, push a lot of product. But you know, of course, the consideration with that is that you can't sell it for as high of a price. So selling retail, it's a grind. He doesn't like people, but he gets more dollars as opposed to selling wholesale. So let's go through. We've detailed out the option. We now need to review the historicals. So. We want to focus on broad categories, and especially as we're thinking about, you know, making a decision quickly, you know, we don't have the time to look at each line item, you know, we need, you know, markets are opening up, we got to get going. So let's focus on four broad categories, and we'll think about the revenue, our cost of production, and our cost of production as it relates to direct expenses, you know, seeds and seedlings and supplies and whatnot, and then also labor. And then we have our selling costs. What is the selling cost to go to one market versus the other? We have the direct expenses, which include you know, market fees and packaging and um, fuel, as well as our time and our labor. And then there's our overhead expenses, which may be liability insurance or tractor repairs and maintenance or phone bills, et cetera. So what's going to change with our uh, opportunity of selling at the farmer's market or wholesale, well, revenue is definitely going to change if we need to offer a discount and we need to decide what kind of discount we want to offer. Our cost of production is probably going to be the same. It's the same product. So, you know, the point of change isn't in the field. The point of change is what post harvest, post production when we start selling. So, cost of production is probably going to be the same. Our selling costs are definitely going to be different. Uh, we're going to have differences in time and differences in, ha in hard costs. And our overhead expenses are probably going to be the same. So we're really zeroing in in the differences in our selling costs. Next, we need to research our new costs. And we got to get comfortable making assumptions. We don't know exactly what it's going to be until we actually get out there and get going. So we need to make assumptions on the best information that we have right now. Certainly we can change them as we move along, but we gotta start somewhere. So the assumptions that I'm gonna make, that Sam made, is that he's gonna deliver two days per week. He's gonna uh, deliver 13 weeks per year, and each delivery run is gonna take him two hours. So the total time is gonna be 52 hours per season. So we can now look at the options side by side. He knows that if he goes to the farmer's market and it takes him eight hours, his cost of production, it's gonna be the same for farmer's market or wholesale. And the selling costs, factoring in the time and the fuel and the market costs, that's where the real change is gonna be. So uh, here we have the farmer's market, here we have the wholesale, and the big difference as well is gonna be the time that it takes to sell to either market. So gross profit, we can see, you know, he's going to make more dollars in his pocket if he goes to the farmer's market than if he goes to the um, wholesale route. But if we think about it in profit per hour and how much is his time worth, in this scenario, in this example, selling wholesale is going to be more a more efficient use of his time, that for every hour he's out selling, he's going to generate $571 compared to the farmer's market, which is going to be 462. But we know something's not going to 
go as planned. And you know, Murphy's law that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And all the assumptions that you made are going to be wrong. And it's not that they're wrong. It's just that they evolve and you learn. So, you know, think about where your risk tolerance is and what could go wrong, what might not work, and then run the scenario again to see how things will change. So what if you're selling wholesale and you realize that you need to discount more than um, 80% or give more than 20% discount to 80% the retail price? What if your customer orders, your wholesale orders are smaller than you anticipated and therefore you need more customers <clears throat> and your selling time goes up? So and what else can go wrong? Um, these are just two examples, but other things might go wrong as well. So, you know, really just put it all out there. So, you know, your selling costs um, increase for wholesale, um, your gross profit, your time is greater. So all of a sudden, if things go wrong, things don't go quite as planned, you know, it may be that the farmer's market is a more clear winner, if you will, in these scenarios. But that's if your assumptions don't work out as you thought. So, you know, see the best case scenario, the realistic scenario, and then if things go wrong, what changes? And then finally, you need to make a decision. Do you sell wholesale or do you sell at the farmer's market and why? And Beth, I will be curious to hear, what do you think? What would you do? Well, Julia, like you, I am pretty risk averse. So I probably would try to do both and spread the risk across um, both markets, yeah. especially now when things are um, very uncertain and changeable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you don't know. There could be changes in both. Yep, yep, and especially in the world of uh, COVID-19 and not really being sure how the farmer's markets are gonna go. And while the, the farmer's market historically have been solid, perhaps they're not. So maybe the wholesale feels less risky just because uh, it's going to be a more consistent demand if you're selling to grocers and cooperatives, for example, versus, you know, selling to restaurants. So really, it depends on which customer base you're going to. Absolutely. But, you know, if I, um, if I had small children at home, which I don't, but if I did, um, I might um, have a, a preference for the wholesale so that I could spend more time with my family. And especially now when um, there's less for kids to do away from home. That might yeah. influence my decision. Yeah. And that's a good point that, um, you know, it's not just dollars and cents, it's lifestyle and personal choices and family values and what's important to you um, in terms of being a holistic person, not just a farmer trying to make as much money as possible. Um, there's a lot of other things that go into these decisions. So great point. Thank you. So let's look at another scenario, and I think this is particularly relevant um, in the post-COVID world. Uh, I know a lot of people are moving their sales online, um, aggregators are popping up, so, so it, you know, more or less selling to a distributor, but I think about aggregators being uh, other farmers that are pulling together everybody's product and then distributing it for you. Um, if you sell through an aggregator, they're going to want a discount from your retail price, of course, because they need to sell it at your retail price and they want to take a cut. Therefore, you need to give them a discount. If you decide to sell online and control your own sales channel, then you need the infrastructure. You need to build a website that's capable of online sales. Um, and then, you know, if you sell online, you're going to have processing fees and so on. So a lot of different variables and you know different costs for each option. So again, we want to review the historicals, what will change uh, and what will stay the same. So revenue definitely is going to change with one venue versus the other. And as both scenarios are new, we don't even know how much they'll change. And we don't necessarily know what market demand will be better or worse. The other consideration is that your cost of production may change. You know, if you had done your crop plan two months ago based on, you know, one scenario, now you're thinking about selling online or through an aggregator, you may need to change your product mix and your cost of production will shift because you've had to shift your products, your cost of production. Um, in terms of your selling costs, you're going to have different selling costs for each 
uh, sales channel. So what will be new, what will be eliminated? Um, and then in terms of overhead, what new infrastructure do you need? So we're gonna make some assumptions. We're gonna assume that we can sell the same amount of product in the online store as we could through the aggregator. We're gonna make the assumption that our cost of production is gonna be the same regardless of the sales channel, but you know, if we're gonna sell $100,000 worth of product, it's, or it's gonna cost us 30,000. If we sell online, we're gonna have to build a new website. And then ongoing expenses, we're gonna have the credit card processing fees of Stripe. And unlike selling at a farmer's market, let's say all sales are gonna have a credit card fee associated with them. Um, so we need to consider that at the highest level. In terms of selling, online store, you're gonna to have to download the orders, you're gonna to have to do the aggregation, you're gonna to have to update your website with the availability each week. So maybe it's gonna take eight hours a week of selling time. If you go through an aggregator, you still need to download orders. You don't have to do any aggregating because they're taking care of it for you, but you do need to update your system with your uh, weekly availability. So maybe it'll be three hours per week. So we can now, with all the numbers, we can lay out the two scenarios side by side and compare our options. Um, we can look at our gross profit, and then we can also look at our profit per selling hour. And you know, certainly the aggregator doesn't bring in as many dollars into our pocket, but the profit per selling hour is more efficient. So if there's an opportunity to increase sales through the aggregator, we may be able to do double the sales and double the gross profit for the same amount of time. But things aren't gonna be correct. Perhaps the aggregator wants a 40% discount. We did our scenario plan and we thought it was gonna be 30%. Maybe the website costs more. Um, maybe we're not as good at websites as we thought we were gonna be and it takes 12 hours per week to manage all our orders as opposed to eight hours per week. Um, maybe our production costs go up because we had to change our product mix. So lots of things could be wrong and we need to sort of sort it out. So we can test our assumptions, different scenarios. And in this case, you know, things change. Um, and profit per hour, it's pretty similar. But, you know, in this scenario, the gross profit selling through an aggregator is dramatically lower than online. And so much lower to the point that, gosh, $9,000, you know, over the course of a season, gosh, I don't know if that's even worth it. You know, while profit per hour, it's not a lot of time, it's still not enough to make it work. So, you know, something to consider, you know, sometimes it's profit per hour that's most important. Sometimes it's like, I just need dollars in my pocket. Um, it doesn't matter how much time it takes. I need cash. So, different variables, different considerations as you lay out the different assumptions. So it does help to have Excel. Uh, it lets you sort of test out the variables and test your assumptions. And I have this Excel template, which is available on my website if you want to download it. And it allows you to, you know, test your assumptions. What happens if uh, cost reduction is 50%, if it's 40%, if 60%. Uh, how many weeks through the course of the season, how many hours per week. And if you have it set up with formulas, then you can you know, change any one of the numbers in the input cells in the blue cells, and it'll update all the other numbers. So it really allows you to see two different scenarios side by side and play around with your assumptions and see where your, not your breaking point is, but where your decision point is, where the inflection point is that it puts you in one decision or another decision. So it does help to be able to put it in an Excel spreadsheet to easily compare the options. So, and then you need to decide, do you sell online or do you sell to an aggregator or why? I'm curious to hear, Beth, what would you do? Well, I think the um, total dollar um, amounts that you um, pointed out are a real, um, selling point for doing the online store. Um, but I also am very comfortable um, online and I would already have a website and have an online presence. So it would be kind of a natural add-on. Um, I think that, for me, that would make sense. 
Cool. And that's a really good point. You know, what is your comfort level with one sales option versus another um, and new technology? So great. Um, and if you have staff and to help you with the aggregation and how does that work? So that might play in as well. And finally, it's really important to be clear on your vision and your values and what's important to you as a person, as a member of the community, as a business person. And, you know, the decisions that you make are not necessarily going to be focused solely on dollars or dollars per hour. It could be focused on how it's going to impact your family. And like Beth said, if you have young kids at home and time is important to be there for them, or if you have made a commitment to your employees, either to allow them not to work to, because they need to be at home or because you wanna make sure that they stay employed and your commitment to your customers and your community. So there are a lot of things that are gonna impact your decision and it's really important to be clear on what's important to you as a person. I wanna thank you all for having me and if you need more support and wanna reach out, you can contact me at my email or get in touch with Kelly at UNH or Beth at UVM. And you can find new, you can find more resources at my website or on the UVM website at New Farmer. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Julia. That was great.